get a chance. Uh, a couple questions <clears throat> that people seem to be having a little bit of an issue with on the, the unit one practices. This one's, I think, from the second one. Okay, what are they asking us to do here? They say write the volume of a sphere in terms of x for a radius of 5, 6x. Okay, so if we're going to start off with volume, here's our formula for volume, right? Now, what's the, if, if, when I look at this volume formula, what's the input quantity there? Calculate a volume. What am I, what am I inputting? Just in general, R. R. Input radius, right? Volume of a sphere depends on the radius of the sphere, right? So here's V of R. Now we're used to plugging in values like two or three or numbers, right? But I can evaluate a function anywhere. Right, I can evaluate it for anything I want to. For example, this kind of may be a weird question, but what's V of A? Let's move there. Let's start off maybe with something a little different. How about if we start off with, let's kind of see if we can establish a pattern. Let's try V of one. What's that going to give me? One. What's my input value? R. R. Okay, in this case, what would it be? Mm -hmm. I'm inputting one, all right. This is, this is the function, right? It defines the rule, which is, means like an equation. So when I input R's, this is what I'm doing to them, right? I'm going to cube the input value of R and then multiply by 4 thirds pi. So if I'm inputting a 1, what am I doing to the 1? No. Times it by 4 over 3 pi. Okay, and then what? Uh, 1 cubed. Okay, so then I'm just going to cube the 1. What is 1 cubed? 1. 1. So my answer just ends up being 4 thirds pi, right? Okay. What's the ordered pair associated with that solution? Or with that value, not really solution. What's, what's the ordered pair associated with that input and output value? Out of order 6. So I input, that's my, that's always going to be the first coordinate, it's going to be the input. It's going to be well, eventually it's going to be x, but for what I just did right here, if I want to write an ordered pair, and ordered pairs are always going to look like, you know, we're used to writing them as x, y on the x, y plane. That's fine. But in general, they're in the form input, output, right? So for this particular case right here, what's the input? One. One, right? What's the output? Uh, v. Which is? Four thirds pi. Four thirds pi, yeah. Right? So that's the ordered pair that we would associate with the value of the function that we just found. What, I mean, that's weird. An ordered pair in that case, what's that mean? Well, probably the most significant thing it means is if I were to graph my input, which is R, versus my output, which is V, this is going to be a point on that graph, right? We would go over 1 and up 4 thirds pi, which is just kind of probably up there, sort of. And that's just going to be one point on 1 point on the graph, if we graphed it, okay? All right, let's go back to this. So we evaluated the function at 1. Now, this might sound weird, but let's evaluate the function at a. What's a? Some number. We, don't, we, have, we didn't specify. Right? If I evaluate this function at a, what do I get back for an answer? Four. 
four thirds pi a cubed, right? Okay, so what is that? Well, we don't know. We never specified what a is, but whatever a is, in terms of a, that's what the output's going to be. Okay. What would what would v of a plus one look like? Plus yeah, times whatever the input in input is, which is the quantity a plus one cubed, right? Now that's not simplified. If I wanted to simplify that, well, what would I do? This output value. Cube yeah, I could cube out the a plus one and then distribute the four thirds pi, and I could get a I mean I could get a string of those terms. I could do that if I wanted to, right? Okay, so in this case, though, they're asking us for something for neither one of those things. They're asking us to evaluate the volume when r is 5, 6 pi. Okay, so what's that give us? Let me, let me do this. How about if I grab this? Go to the next page. So what am I going to do this time? Put 5, 6 in for x. Ah, okay. I'm going to put 5, 6 x in for r. Oh. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So we're going to have, once again, you know, v of r is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So v of hand, whatever that is, whatever's behind my hand, is just equal to 4 thirds times pi times hand cubed, right? That's our pattern, agreed? But what's behind my hand this time? 5, 6, x. 5, 6, x, right? 5, 6, x. Oh, that's pretty easy. See what I'm saying? So now let's go ahead and simplify this one. What would I do here to simplify? Cube. I'm going to have to cube out this whole thing. This takes us back to properties of exponents. If I have a product of 5 over 6 times x, what can I do with my exponent? I can distribute because nothing's being added or subtracted. Everything's just being multiplied and divided, right? So we could take this 3 and distribute it to each of the three factors. And that's going to give us, if we do that, 4 thirds pi. Yeah, what's, what's 5 cubed? 125. 125. What's 6 cubed? 216. And then x cubed is x cubed, right? So last step would just be to multiply this out. Now, Okay, so this brings us to one other little issue here. When we have a complicated product of a bunch of stuff like that, bookkeeping is important in math. We want to we want to follow kind of a uh, a recognizable pattern when we write out this kind of stuff. We're going to have a convention that we stick to. So I'm going to have some numbers, pi, which is a number, but it's a special number. It's a constant, so we write it as a symbol, and a power of x. Which one do you think we want to put first? The numbers, actually. We'll, we'll, we'll turn all the cardinal numbers into a fraction, maybe, or something, right? And then that's going to go first, then the pi, then the, the constant, right, the, new, the symbolic number, then the variables in alphabetical order. Okay, there's only one this time, so just x's. But if we had x's and y's and z's, we always want to put those in alphabetical order because then when we're adding up like terms later on, when things get more messy and complicated, it's easier for us to spot the like terms if we always put them in alphabetical order. Okay? So let's deal with the numbers then. Uh, let's see. Let's look at the 125 over 3. Is 125 divisible by 3? No. How, how, how do you know that? Oh, 
it doesn't go into five. It's a good way to think about it. There's another trick when we've got a big long number to know if it's divisible by three. Do you remember what that is? It's the last number is. No, you're thinking of like if it's a five, five would if the last number is five or zero, then five would go into it. It yeah. works for that, doesn't it? Uh, but what about, and like for two, if the last number is even, then two goes into it, right? But for threes, it's different, do you remember? If you add up the digits of the number, if the result is divisible by three, then the number is divisible by three. So in this case, one plus two plus five is eight. Is eight divisible by three? Yeah. So 125 is not. That works all the time? All the time, yeah. Always works. Well, I never could do that. that. <laughs> I never knew that. I couldn't use that. So, so we're stuck with a 125 on top and a 3 on the bottom. How about a 4 and 216? Does that reduce? Yeah. That does, doesn't it? 4 goes into 216. What? 4 goes into 21. 5 times with 1 left over and 4 goes into 16. 4. Good. So that reduces to 1 over 54. And then there we're kind of stuck, aren't we? So now the number parts, if I multiply straight across, I'm going to get 1 times 125 is 125. 3 times 54 is what? What's 3 times 50? It's 160. So 150, good. Plus 3 times 4 is my 12 for 162, right? So 162. And then we could put everything on top if we want to. This time, let's not. Let's go ahead and just write the fraction first. Then we've got the pi. And then we've got our x cubed. Right? Does that make sense? So what we end up with then, we get a function. Now, here's what I want you to see. When we substituted 5, 6 pi into this, we got a result that's in terms of what variable this time? We don't see r's in our answer anymore. Now we see what? X's, right? So we could write this if we wanted to. We could write this now as some function, which we know to be a volume function, of X, right? So V of X equals this stuff, 125 over 162 times pi X cubed, okay? So that's what we're looking for. We've written the volume now as a function not of R, but of x, because we made this substitution, we traded our r's for an expression that has x's in it. Okay? About one more like that. Something like this. There. If a rectangle has a length of x and a width of 2x cubed minus, three, minus 3x squared plus 4x, can we come up with a perimeter function in terms of x? Okay? So let's label this thing first. How about so let's call, just because I've got more room to write here, let's call this one the width. So that's going to have uh, dimension 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 4x. And we'll call this the length, which is x. Okay? So then if we want to come up with perimeter, well, we've got to go back to geometry for just a second. What is our, our general definition of perimeter? In terms of just width and length. Add together. Add all the sides. All the sides. What would that look like for a formula then? Uh, how many widths and how many lengths are we adding up? Two L's. Okay, good. Two plus. Two times the width oh, plus yeah. two times the length. Either or, it doesn't matter, right? Okay, so for us then, this is our width and that's our length, right? So what's that going to look like then? We're going to get our perimeter is equal to two times that quantity plus 2 times that quantity, right? How many different kinds of variables do you see in there? One. One. Just x's, right? So then we could write this as a function of x, right? We could input x values to, out to, get, to get outputs for our function, right? And we could simplify this a little bit. What would the last step or steps be to simplify here? Distribute. Distribute. So if I distribute the 2, what am I going to get? 4x uh, four four x cubed minus 6x cubed plus 6x squared. Squared. Plus 8x. 
Okay, we're going to get a plus 8x plus 2x. So what would that be? 10. Okay. Okay, make sense? So that's our that's our perimeter function. Okay. And then what about this one? When the length is 6 meters, the perimeter is what? Well, we said the length was x, right? So what value would we be plugging into our function to find the perimeter for this case right here where the length is 6? Six, 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 six for x. Say it again. 6 for x. Right. That corresponds to x equals 6 in our drawing, doesn't it? Because that's the length. Okay. So then we would just take this function down here and plug in 6 and get 4 times 6 cubed minus 6 times 6 squared plus 10 times 6, which is, what's that going to be? Uh, well, 36, so negative 36 plus 60. So what about uh, 24? Thinking? You can check. But anyway, we're going to get an answer if we plug that in. Questions? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, how about this one? Last one we'll look at for re review of the first three assignments. Rate of change. So if we want to find the average rate of change over the interval from x equals 8 up to x equals 4, how are we going to do that? So the, uh, oh, I don't know. So x what equals negative 8. What's the value of the function at negative 8? Uh, it's like 4. OK, so there's the point corresponding to an x value of negative 8. So the coordinates of that would be negative 8, positive 4. Okay. How about x equals 4? 0. It's like that's at 0, doesn't it? So the coordinates there, everybody agree, 4, 0? Okay. Okay, so why did I draw that line? Because that's your rate of change. Oh. Okay. Yeah, right. Remember, the slope of the line connecting the starting point and the ending point it corresponds to average rate of change. For an average, recall that we don't care what happens in the middle. It doesn't make any difference. All we care about is what happens at the start in the end, right? And so we said if we want to come up with a, you know, kind of a, a formula for average rate of change, we just get change in output, right? So change in y over change in input, which we could also write if we want to as like uh, change in the function over change in x, right? Let's make a slope triangle. So what's the change in the output going to be? Well, we start here and we end up there. So if I wanted to draw an arrow, what's that arrow going to look like? You kind of lost me on that last thing you just did. <laughs> okay, let's do that again. Let's do that again. So the average rate of change is just the slope of that line, right? But what's slope? Change in y over change in x. Right. So really all this is is just... is just m, right? Change in y. Remember, y is just equal to the output of the function, isn't it? Right? So we can just see how much the function changes. Okay, so in this case, if we define this function as f of x, well then what is, based on this point right here, what is f of 4? Or sorry, negative 8. Whoops. What is f of negative 8? 
I input negative eight, I get back four, don't I? Right? I input negative eight and I get back four, right? The input is the x value, the output is always going to be the y value. What is f of positive four? Zero. Zero. Okay, so how much did the function change? Well, the value of the function changed from four to zero, right? So when we say delta f of x, another way of thinking about that is the f of the final value of x minus f evaluated at the initial value of x, right? Divided by what's delta x? It's just the final value of x minus the initial value of x. That's the way we write initial. We just put a sub-zero in there. Sometimes we call it x naught. You know, I mean, it just means at time zero, like in physics. We could make it an i if we want to, but that's what you're going to see most of the time. Okay. So if we plug in the blanks, then this is just going to be zero. That's our final output value. The color code this is even better. Zero minus. Four, right? Over our final x value is four plus eight minus our initial. It would be negative eight, so we're adding eight, aren't we? Minus negative eight. Everybody see that? Okay. And so that just works out to be. A slope of what? Negative 4 over 12, which is negative 1 third. But we could probably see that more easily just from a slope triangle, right? And that they just, same thing, aren't they? I rise. Remember, when I'm calculating a slope, I always have to go from left to right. The ant has to be walking in the positive x direction, right? So if I start here, I'm going to rise by negative 4, and I'm going to run by positive. Well, well, there's my negative four twelfths, or negative one third. Okay. What happens in, in the middle? Who cares? The average rate of change doesn't care. It just wants to know what's the difference between the starting input and output values and the final input and output values, right? Okay. All right. So for today, here's our new stuff. Not hard. Not hard at all. We're just going to be. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at graphs and we're going to be defining where the function has specific behaviors or characteristics. So one of these I'm not, isn't even in the reading. It's just simple. It's just kind of a demonstration example as much as anything. So we want to use one or more inequalities to write the interval or intervals on which the function is positive value. Well, what in the world is that? When the function is positive value. Where, remember, the value of a function is the x or the y. The, the y. We're going to input the x's into the function and get the value of the function, which is going to be the y, right? We, we can always make this, if you're ever unsure, if everybody's familiar with this statement, y equals f of x, right? So we're inputting x values go into there, but whatever we get as a result uh, equals y, right? So when we talk about the value of a function, we're always talking about the y value of a function. So where would a function be positive value? In other words, where would the y values be positive, the y coordinates? Where is that going to happen just in general on the xy plane? Above zero. Above what? What do you mean above zero? You're right, but above what equals zero? Above y equals zero. What does y equals zero look like on our xy plane? Ah, oh, that's the x-axis, right? So all the points above the x-axis are going to be the places where the function is positive value. Okay, so that's easy. We can just look at the graph, and by inspecting the graph, we can see where that stuff happens. So just kind of non-mathematically, just qualitatively, why, where on this graph would an ant be above the x-axis when he's walking along this graph? Uh, you do tell me, tell me when. I'll start right here, for example. The ant's walking along. Tell me when he starts to be positive value. Oh, he's starting to go positive down there. Okay, so, oh, I know what you mean. 
Well, as soon as he gets past past six, right? He's positive value, positive value. Oh, now he starts to be negative value, right? So there's one interval right there, isn't it? Okay, so. So we can say that along larger. this part of the curve right there is positive value. So now let's think about the x values, because that's really what we're asking for. We want to write the intervals. When we say write the intervals, we mean x, or input values, right? So when we say, where is this happening on a function? We mean for what values of the input is it happening? So how would I define that? I could draw it, couldn't I? I could draw. Along the x-axis, I could draw a little segment that defines all the values where the function is looped up above the x-axis. So it's just in that loop is what we're talking about. Just in that loop. So what would the starting x value be? Six. Six. Do I include six? No. I don't. You're right. Because at six, the value of the function is zero. zero. Is zero a positive number? No. It's not. It's not positive and it's not negative. It's in between. Right? It's the boundary between positive and negative. So I wouldn't include that x value, and I wouldn't include that one. I would only include the values in between, right? We see that that green segment that defines the places where the function is positive valued. Okay. So now let's write that as an inequality. X is what? How would I say that as an inequality? Greater than six, six less than eight. and less than eight. Okay. There's one interval where it's positive value. There's another one, though. Where else is it positive value? Like okay, so it looks like everything over there, the ant's going to be above the x-axis, right? Does that make sense? Not at 3, but where relative to 3? Above. To the left. Okay, so those are, yeah, those are the x values where the function is above the x-axis, right? So how do I say that interval? using an inequality. X is less than 3. Yeah, so I've got two of them. X is less than 3 or X is greater than 6 and less than 8. Oh. So really the word we want there is or, but we're going to use a comma to mean or, to separate the intervals. When you see a comma like that, it means or. Okay. So if multiple intervals exist, if multiple intervals exist, separate them with commas. So this is what we would input into Moodle then. Right? That's our answer in that case. That makes sense? Okay? All right, so next step. Next step is to add another concept to this. Now, instead of just being positive or negative, we're going to look at the concept of increasing versus decreasing. So this has to do with slopes, right? What does it mean, and let's be non-mathematical here for a second, just kind of qualitatively, what does it mean for a function to be increasing? Say it again. The numbers are going up. The numbers are going up. So as an ant walks in the positive x direction from left to right, what is the ant experiencing when he's on an increasing part of the function? He's going uphill, right? Increasing means uphill from left to right. Decreasing means downhill, downhill from left to right. Let's be a little more mathematical with that. Let's look at this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, Let's, we want to define this, this part of the function where it's increasing. Well, let, let's put some boundaries in here, first of all. Where is the boundary between increasing and decreasing? At what value does the ant... Negative 2. At negative 2. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? So here's the ant walking up this function. He's walking uphill. He's increasing. But at some point, he's going to flip over and start going downhill. Where, where does it change? Well, the boundary is going to be right there, isn't it? Yeah. Right. So everything to the left of that, we would say, is an interval where it's increasing, right? Okay. So if I wanted to graph that on the x-axis, that interval on the x-axis, I would put an open circle or a closed circle. Closed. Ah, so we got a debate going here. Why? Why would? Why closed? Can you give me an example. Of why closed? Right on. So we want the only the parts where he is increasing. Oh, so if you're so it would be open. So it'd be open, wouldn't it? If you're hiking in the mountains, you're walking up the slope to get to a peak, right? When you get to the top of that peak, are you going uphill anymore? No. Are you going downhill? No. 
you're in between, right? So we're going to say it's increasing on that interval, right? Does that make sense? Where else? The other way. So where, where's the other boundary? Two. Two. So it's increasing also on, oops, on this interval, right then? Do you agree? Where's it decreasing? Oh, yeah. So in, in between the boundaries, right? So it'd be decreasing on this interval in here. Right? Okay. Good. Now why is that? Let's look at this mathematically. We said an ant's walking uphill. Well, you know, probably in a math textbook that's not the way they're going to formally define increasing. In math, we want to we want to write things using mathematical symbols in a way that is completely abstract and unambiguous, right? So you can't it can't be misunderstood. So what if we said something like this? If b is a value of x that's greater than a, okay. So for example, if a is negative six, b could be negative 5.9, right? is negative 5.9 is greater than 6. If B is 10, uh, sorry, if, if A is 10, then B could be like 10.01, slightly bigger. Or it could be 11, but it's got to be bigger than A, right? Okay? So if that's true, if B is greater than A, so B is to the right of A on a number line, when the function is increasing, what's the relationship have to be between the output of the function, meaning the Y value at B, and the y value at a. So I'm stepping from x equals a to x equals b. What has to happen to my elevation when I do that, if I'm increasing? Yeah. Has to go up, right? So would you agree that f of b, the value of the function here, has to be greater than f of a, the, out, the value of the function here, right? So this is a mathematical way, then, of saying a function is increasing, right? When b is greater than a, f of b is greater than f of a, right? And that would have to happen both there and there, wouldn't it, right? Well, conversely, if it's decreasing, when my x value changes from a to b, my elevation has to drop, right? So the value, the output value, the y value here has to be less than the y value here, right? Isn't that what this is saying right there? When b is greater than a, f of b has to be less than f of a. So that's our mathematical way of saying what we described earlier using just regular words, right? Okay, so, so how would we define these intervals then? Where is this function increasing? How would we input this in movement? Um, less than x is... Okay, good. Less than negative. negative two. Or, so comma, x is greater than two. That's where it's increasing, right? Where is it decreasing? X. Okay, good. X is greater than negative 2 and less than 2. How many intervals are there where the function is decreasing? One. Yep, there it is, right? How many intervals where the function is increasing? Two. Two. There and there. Right? Okay, what do we... We... we that's good. We defined where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. Let's focus on the boundaries for a second. What do we, like, map, or uh, in terms of just an ant walking along a two-dimensional terrain, we would probably say the ant is at a peak right there, wouldn't we? And at a valley right there. Okay? We're going to attach maybe some different words. Mathematically, what do you suppose the word we use for peak is? You've probably heard it before. It starts with an M. What? M? An M. Mm -hmm. Mode. Medium. Mm -hmm. 
maximum, right? Oh. So we call that a maximum. And this also starts with an M, what we call this one, minimum. Specifically, what we would call this is a local maximum and a local minimum, right? So here's a local maximum, right? So it's at the point right there. And a local minimum occurs at that x value and that y value, and that's right there. Okay, why local? What does the word local mean in just regular English? Around, close to. Close to, like in the immediate vicinity, right? So um, we could say that the weather, the local weather might be sunny, but on the west side it's probably rainy, right? So local means in the vicinity of us. So this is a local maximum because when the ant climbs up on this peak, he can survey the surroundings. He's higher than the surrounding terrain, but is he necessarily on the highest place he could ever go? No. He could go over here and go up much higher, right? But in his immediate, you know, locally speaking, that is the highest point, meaning he had to step up to get there and his next step is going to be down, right? Does that make sense? So we could say then that a, whoops, a maximum is really just a point of transition from increasing to decreasing, isn't it? That's a good definition, mathematical definition of what a maximum is. It's where you transition from increasing to decreasing on a function. What would a minimum be? Lowest. Yeah, you go from decreasing to increasing, right? That's that's a value or a minimum. Okay. All right. I think you guys got this. I don't think we need to probably do any more. Can grab a Chromebook and work a little bit. How much time we got? Five oh, five minutes? Oh, that's not that much. Well, you can still, if you want to get some questions answered or something, go ahead. You can work a little bit.